Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord at the beginning of the year? And uh, hands up who's kept all their resolutions till now. We're five days into keeping our New Year's resolutions, and uh, I'm sure you've fulfilled every one of them up until now. No? Oh, in you have. Praise the Lord, mate. I'm, I'm really pleased about that. If you haven't, you've got another 51 weeks to, uh, to get it all sorted, okay? This morning, I'd just like us to think about the word celebrities. You know, when we see what's happening on TV with uh, celebrities around the world and how these people are chased and looked and sought after, and, you know, just recently, last year, at the end of last year, they had that big um, celebration in regards to the release of the film The Hobbit. <clears throat> Why you ought to go see that for, I don't know. But, uh, you know, just to see how they spend a lot of money uh, organising the red carpet for all the stars to walk down. But what amazed me the most was the amount of people, hundreds, thousands of people, lined up the streets to see these stars of this particular show, The Hobbit. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. There's not only that particular show that people uh, will come and see. Around the world, there's many stars that are chased after, uh, many celebrities uh, who are, you know, people spend time trying to find out where they can meet them and that. And, of course, the red carpet is put out not only for movie stars, but people from the music world, from the sports arena, and even politi our politicians, uh, the red carpet is put out for them. Uh, especially overseas visiting uh, politicians, the red carpet's put out, and such a fuss is made, and a lot of money uh, is, um, is spent. Excuse me. The other thing, too, of course, for the royal family, they were just here uh, recently at the end of last year also, and again, um, out comes the red carpet. But while I was just thinking about this, you know, and all this fuss that is made over these celebrity, I was thinking, of course, of another celebrity. But, you know, on the other side of the coin, too, we also have the paparazzi who are also chasing and seeking after these, um, these so-called celebrities. They're always trying to be the first one to get that particular photo so they can sell it. Uh, their, their, their company, their magazine, their newspaper can sell it for a, a lot of money. Or they're trying to, to photograph an event that maybe would be negative or positive towards those particular people. And it's amazing in how many places you go where you see these magazines of celebrities uh, on the coffee table or on the tables where people love to read about other people. And um, my thought comes back again to this one particular celeb that, uh, that we all should be seeking and chasing. And I'd like to pick our story up in the book of John, chapter 12. The book of John, chapter 12, and reading from verse 12 to 16. So here we are. all with me, John chapter 12, verse 12, and reading down to verse 16. And it says, On the next day, much people that would come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that come in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found an ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. Well, it may not have been the red carpet, but culturally, the equivalent of at least for a king as they laid these palm branches. They took branches of palm trees and laid them before Jesus as he rode in to Jerusalem on this little colt. Fit, a parade fit to welcome a king. But was there a great expense in money? No, no, it was a simple, simple procedure as Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. And isn't it amazing that they said, said to him, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The same salutation that was given to Jesus at his birth in Bethlehem. A large portion of those who profess to be looking for Christ would be as forward and as bold as these Pharisees. 
It says, let us follow Jesus as he so merely rode into Jerusalem. When the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among them, the multitude, said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should not hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And of course, a large profession of, like I said before, of us Christians would be as forward and as bold as Pharisees were to have the disciples silenced. And they would doubtfully rise to cry, fanaticism, fanaticism. But God will have a people on the earth who will not be so cold. He doesn't want a group of cold people and dead, but, they, but those that can praise him and glorify him. He will receive glory from some people, and if those of his choice, those who keep his commandments, should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. Again, it just underlines and emphasizes our responsibility to get the word of the Lord out there and to glorify him who deserves our worship. And that's what we saw in the Sabbath school, as Jamie took this morning. When you think that the, the pictures of the universe, God is the only one who is worthy of our worship. Another story I'd like to pick up this morning is also in the book of uh, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. So if you could all turn there to chapter 19, please. Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 1, and then we'll go down to uh, verse 10. Another great story regarding our Saviour Jesus. And it starts off, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among, among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Isn't that a wonderful story about that? little man, that little tax collector, um, Zacchaeus. And in our summary, it simply says that Jericho was one of the cities anciently set apart for the priest, for the priest in the ministry of, uh, of uh, the temple. And at this time, large numbers of priests had their residence in Jericho. But the city had also a population of a widely different character. It was a very cosmopolitan city at this stage. There was a great center of traffic, and Roman officials and soldiers with strangers from different quarters were found there, while the collection of customs made it also uh, the home of many of the, of the publicans, the tax collectors. And of course, the chief among the publicans was this young man named Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. And he was a Jew and detested by his countrymen. His rank and his wealth were the reward of a calling they absolutely hated and which was regarded as another name simply for injustice and extortion. So it happened even back then as it does today um, by servants of the government. Yet this wealthy customs officer was not altogether the little hardened man of the world that he seemed. Beneath the appearance of worldliness and pride was a heart susceptible to divine influences. Zacchaeus had heard 
of Jesus. The report of one Jesus who had borne himself with kindness and courtesy towards the certain classes had spread far and wide. In the heart of this chief publican was awakened a, lo a longing for a better life. Only a few miles from Jericho, John the Baptist had preached at the Jordan and Zacchaeus had heard of the call to repentance, as many others had. And John the Baptist's instructions to the publicans was, exact no more than which is appointed you. And we find that in Luke chapter 3, verse 13. Though outwardly disregarded, had impressed his mind, he knew the scriptures, and he was convicted that his practice, or that this practice, was wrong. Now hearing the words reported to have come from the great teacher, he felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God. Yet what he had heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart, repentance, reformation of life was possible even to him, even to Zacchaeus. Um, eternal life was possible to him. Wait, he thought. Wait, what, was it not one of the teacher's uh, most trusted disciples also, a publican? And we know who that is, don't we? Matthew. Zacchaeus began at once to follow the conviction that had taken hold upon him and to make restitution to those whom he had wronged. Already he had begun thus to retrace his steps when the news sounded through Jericho that Jesus was entering the town. Zacchaeus determined to see him, to search out and find him. He was beginning to realize how bitter are the fruits of sin and how difficult the path is for him who tries to return from a cause of wrong. To be misunderstood, to be met with suspicion and distrust in the effort to correct his errors was hard for him to bear. The chief publican longed to look upon the face of him whose words had brought hope to his heart. On this particular day, the streets were crowded and Zacchaeus, who was small of stature, could see nothing over the heads of the people. No one would give way for him, so running a little in advance of the multitude, uh, we'd understand that to be a procession, to where a wide branching sycamore tree hung over the way. The rich tax collector climbed to a seat among the boughs where he would survey the procession as it passed below. Let us just kind of visualize that scene. Just imagine the picture. Here's this little tax collector guy sitting nestled up in the branches of this sycamore tree which is similar to an American maple. For some of you who know uh, your plants and trees, the maple uh, is a beautiful tree with uh, nice brightly colored leaves. And all of a sudden we have this crowd of people come near and, uh, and as it goes by, Zacchaeus scans the, gr the, the crowd eagerly to discern that one person he longs to see. And of course, before the crowd, there's the priest and the rabbis. And isn't it interesting that in this procession of people where Jesus always is, you have your priest and your rabbis hanging around, always trying to find fault with Jesus. Suddenly, just beneath the tree, a group halts. The company before and behind come to a standstill. And they're most probably wondering why Jesus has stopped. And then one looks up, and it's, uh, of course, Jesus. Looks up to him who's sitting in the boughs of the tree. Almost doubting his senses, the man in the tree, Zacchaeus, um, says, no, this can't be happening. But uh, he hears the voice uh, from Jesus, who the man who he wanted to see, say to him, make haste and come down for today I must abide in thy, in thy house. What a picture that must have been, you know. Here's Zacchaeus trying to see Jesus and he's running up ahead of the group and then he climbs up into the tree. Just, he just wanted to find him and seek him and, and see what he looked like. And then suddenly he gets an invitation to come down by the very one 
uh, who changed his life because he says, I want to dwell in your house today.